Good morning and welcome to Coffee Time with Kaufman, the comfortable place to talk about women's leadership. Today we have Leah Murphy with us to talk about today's topic, how negotiation skills are making the world a better place. Hey Leah. Hi Maria, good morning. Leah is the author of Salary Power Moves, Winning the Compensation Negotiation. Leah wrote this book to help others learn how to negotiate for more. Inside her book, you will find proven strategies for your next negotiation from a corporate insider. But before I get into that, my name is Maria Kaufman and I'm a life coach. Today, I'm on my second cup of flavored coffee. I'm done uh, the Vermont maple and now I'm drinking butter toffee. Mm. What are you drinking, Leah? I actually am drinking water this morning, Maria, because I have some really aggressive hydration goals that I'm trying to get to oh, in preparation for, you know, for the warmer weather. So, yeah, I am up to a gallon of water a day and I have a gallon <gasps> sitting next to me. Oh, good for <laughs> yes, you. I'm drinking water today. I'm so bad at that. So you are inspiring me already. There we go. Awesome. And hey, I know that we checked in before we started the show, but isn't it nice to have some sun? It is. I am based out of Philadelphia. That's where my business is based. And just the opportunity to look out the window and feel like the sun is coming in to welcome you. is such a pleasant experience to transition seasons. It's a really long winter. So I'm excited to be transitioning into spring. Yeah. So we're so, I am so glad to have you. I know everyone listening will be so glad to have you because we are talking about a very important topic about negotiation. You know, women are typically really bad at it, <laughs> but help us understand. Uh, I know you and I have a little bit, of, a couple things in common as we have an engineering profession in common. Help us understand how you got to be where you are today. Take us wherever you want us to go. Yeah. So my background is in mechanical engineering. So I studied um, at Temple University in Philadelphia, really had an amazing experience there, even though it was hard, right? <laughs> like university was hard. Um, yes. <laughs> it definitely presented a fair amount of challenges, but it also connected me with some really amazing people and organizations. So I joined the Society of Women Engineers, but also joined the National Society of Black Engineers while I was at university and then went on to have amazing experiences by building networks and relationships through those professional organizations. So they have a special place in my heart. Um, so then I started working full time out of undergrad and doing technical roles, kind of the traditional engineering path in manufacturing sites and enjoyed the work and progressively wanted to do a little bit more, right? So once you master one thing, you're really excited to learn something else, right? That's kind of, I'm a natural learner innately. I wanna see what a new challenge is that I can take over. Um, and then I started moving into roles that were more business facing. And that re the reason for that was engineering taught me a ton, lots of technical depth, lots of really amazing understanding of the operation, how things work. But what it left me wanting more of is how does this affect the business? How does what I do matter to the, you know, the top line or the bottom line? And there's so many people in the organization that seem to have a really clear understanding of this is what my work contributes to. And I wanted to get closer to that. I also wanted to make sure that I got to have a little bit more decision making power. As you know, Maria, right? engineers tend to get to the get the problem when it's something intense and needs to be solved and you got to get it figured out and you're on a tight window. But I always was challenged and thinking, OK, well, why didn't we know this six or eight months ago? Why didn't we know this two years ago where we could have had adequate time to maybe explore and bring on the right partners and you know do some deep analysis? And I realized that those decisions were happening two years ago. They just weren't trickling down to me. So <laughs> I decided to make some choices to move up the decision making continuum into roles that were a little bit more business facing. So I took roles in procurement and also roles in strategy. So that helped really round out my background. That is so interesting because now you're mechanical yeah. and even at that, that end of the line process, there was electrical, especially controls and automation was really the last stop. That's true. And I guess I took an interesting different perspective. So I love to hear how you were a little bit more savvy in that uh, perspective that you were 
wanting and uh, understanding those contributions and decision making. Because for me, it was kind of like, I, I felt like I always just had to be the hero at the end. Like, yeah. oh, finally, you know, we're really these troubleshooters and these problem solvers at the very end. And I didn't have that that uh, I guess that perspective or that drive to, to want to move the impact uh, up further, I guess, and, and yeah. just change that. So I got to work with some amazingly talented engineers. I mean, I credit so many people and not just the engineers, but the skilled trades that I got to work with, electricians, mechanics, um, metal workers. I had some really great opportunity to learn from people who literally were experts in the field. And I enjoyed that from a learning perspective, as well as getting a chance to really collaborate with them and help to like bring ideas to life. Like we would literally say, how do you make this rotate 360 degrees? Okay, we're going to spend the time, draw it out. So I'm a problem solver. I'm into it. But what I realized was, to your point, the opportunity to work with cross-functional partners who were in maybe on the brand team, maybe on the procurement team, maybe on the sales team, really started to expose me to other parts of the business that were really very influential and had the real decision-making power, right? If sales says the customer is looking for this, they're going to get engineering to give the customer what they want. So I wanted to get closer to, well, who's the customer and what are they doing? What are their priorities? How do we make sure that the dollar value that I'm bringing as an engineer, that ROI um, or return on investment really does materialize and then we actually get what we're looking for, right? There's projects that die, that right, that get killed mm -hmm. because we didn't have the right math up front. We weren't really clear what the consumer needed. So we made the mistake, right? And then we had to invest a lot of time and money into that. And as somebody who was at the back end of that, investing the time, traveling, being away from my family, I wanted to make sure that I got closer so I learned a little bit more. So I actually had the opportunity to work in procurement. There was just a lot of adjacencies, a lot of, you know, I knew enough about our customers, about our equipment, so that I could talk to our suppliers and negotiate really large contracts and deals because there was a mutually beneficial understanding and negotiation really started for me at that intersection on a big, on a grand scale. So That's in procurement, I had a team of folks, really talented buyers, and we negotiated with large multinational companies on behalf of the organization that we worked for, for millions and millions of dollars. And that was the crazy part. I'm thinking, wow, if I could get paid one tenth, right, of what I'm negotiating for, maybe the game could change, right? So light bulbs start to go off about the value that I was able to bring to the company being in that role. And I could see very transactionally, it go directly to the cost of goods, right? I negotiate a great deal. Those savings start to show up the next month in our cash flow. And I could see the value that I brought to the company. So it really helped me to expand my horizons. And, you know, I was able to leverage my engineering skill set. So it made me really a double, uh, a double threat in that way. So I was excited about it. And it really opened the door to say, oh, man, negotiation could be powerful. There's a lot that we can accomplish through this skill set. So that's how I started down the path. And then it was kind of like, well, you can't hold me back now. Right now, I feel like I can negotiate for everything. Now it kind of applies as a decision making or thought process. How do you make sure that you're making mutually beneficial arrangements, but it's based in not emotion, right? It's not based in frustration. It's based in fact. It's based in value. And it's based on long term business impact, which is how I came to write the book. So the book really came from this place of how do you take this skill set that was developed on the business front for procurement, but then apply it to individual basis? Because I had been negotiating for compensation for a long time, sometimes well, right? Sometimes I nailed it and it went fantastically, yeah. sometimes not. So I felt like if I could put a little bit of an engineering twist to it, right, put a system in place so that I could have a reliable check and balance to go back to, and then I could give myself the opportunity to negotiate for more because I had the right leverage, right? We talked a little bit earlier when I knew the value I brought to the company and how much of an asset I was, then I knew that I could use that to my own advantage to be able to negotiate. And there is where we started to put all the wheels in motion together that brought us to writing salary power moves, winning compensation negotiation. And I say us because my, my small business has grown um, really from this idea that we want to help 10,000 women learn how to negotiate for better compensation. And it's audacious, right? It's like, yeah, <laughs> no, <laughs> right. But this, if we think about it and you said it earlier, women are not necessarily 
seen to be strong negotiators and why, right? Why is that? What, what holds us back? Lots of things, right? Lots and lots of things. But what it really comes down to is they, they're not trained, right? A lot mm -hmm. of times people want to do the right thing, but they don't have the know-how. And I wanted to for women to hear it from another woman that A, negotiating is your responsibility as an advocate to yourself, right? To yourself. To yourself, being your own self-advocate. Because so many people feel like, wow, maybe people won't like me or maybe my manager or the HR team would be put off by it. And I pause yeah. and think like, well, our counterparts are not concerned about that. At all. At all. They don't hesitate for a moment to ask for more, even wh whether they believe they deserve it or not. I think they always believe they deserve it. But um, knowing that that kind of audacity really isn't trained into women, right? Yes. We are often doing great work, adding additional value, but you know, feeling uncomfortable making those kinds of asks. So the book was really designed for anyone who is getting into the space of wanting to learn how to negotiate so that they can prepare for your next negotiation. Because your next negotiation is always right around the corner, whether it's for a new role, whether it's for a new car, whatever it is you're looking for, negotiation is a part of our life. So I wanted to be really specific and add, apply it to salary and compensation because that's how people can build wealth for themselves and for their family. So that kind of real impact is what drove me to bring the book to life. I love it. You are singing to the choir here. So, so important to hear all of these. And it's a very, very inspiring story, but help us uh, take a couple steps back. Yeah. Where, where were your early memories for even getting into engineering? Help us understand how, you know, even way back, you were paving a, a path and creating a journey for yourself that ended up in this awesome place. Yeah. So help us understand a couple of those early uh, milestones that, that may pop out and help us understand your journey. Certainly. So if you think about um, the, the most untraditional engineer, I'll raise my hand, right? So I am a self-proclaimed weirdo, right? And I, you, I say that with pride. And I know for a lot of people that word has a lot of power and words have power. So my intention is to take it back and say, I was so offbeat. I was so, um, you know, kind of in the clouds and doing all kinds of goofy, weird stuff. I'm doing science projects and competing in national science fairs as a high school student. I had amazing opportunities where teachers, you know, pulled me into these kind of unique mechanical writing classes and technical writing classes. So I got to, you know, I was fed the opportunity to do something in a technical realm really early. My dad is a mechanic by trade um, and my mom is a nurse. So very blue collar, very amazing, like just talented people, experts at their craft. And they really encouraged me, you gotta go to college, right? You gotta go to college. We're doing all this work to create the opportunity for you. And my parents are amazing, they're still with me. So I feel really fortunate to still have them as part of my life. And they encouraged me to go to college and I had to figure out what did I wanna study that was actually gonna make it worthwhile for me to make money outside of college, right? But I also like tie in with my interests. So as someone who was you know, a weirdo, a super nerd, late, bloomer right early early on i want to give any of your late bloomers who might be listening yeah. it's okay right it's, it's okay. all okay right we're not gonna all peak in high school that's right we may not even peak in college and that's yes. still okay thank you because that, yeah. that's important i think those stories are really important to hear and to share and to know and that leaning, leaning into the inner weirdo for me is where things became easier because as soon while I was resisting it and like trying to fit in and trying to do what I thought, you know, seemed like it made sense and what other people wanted me to do, I was always in this like, well, you know, in this stance of limbo where I'm kind of waiting for the next thing to happen. Once I said, like, listen, this is this is what I like. These are the things I'm interested in. These are the things I'm really good at and started to really do them on a regular basis. It just opened up so many doors for me. So leaning into my inner weirdo and being unique in an individual as a black woman in STEM, right, in an inner city university, and then going on to do science fairs in, in biology and engineering, really like, you know, I'm the only one in the room. I'm the only black person in the room a lot of times. I'm definitely the only woman in the room. So that kind of really positioned me to think about myself as progressively moving into a space that didn't necessarily fit me, but I felt like there was a place for me to be able to show up and do it. So 
that adversity of being kind of the one and the only sometimes really encouraged me to find that community, right? So we talked about joining the National Society of Black Engineers. That community really helped me to see, okay, I do belong. This makes sense. There are others like me. We might be spread across the country, right? And it may take a national conference for us to be able to get together, but we're here. And that network helped me to get internship, excuse me, internships, full-time roles really brought me into the community. And then corporate America is the path that I chose coming after that. So that's a little bit of the backstory of how taking the path that was, you know, not at all clear and <laughs> my family had taken before. And the weirdo in me was really excited to kind of be in this new space and kind of be able to geek out on thermodynamics and all of those things. So I still was able to find friends yeah. and community because I was able to attract the people who were attracted to my authenticity. Right. So once I could be myself now, you know, we could talk about running triathlons or we could talk about, you know, you know, designing code. We could talk about the things that I was into because they were attracted to me. So I had a small and mighty little clan and we would click and we would, you know, do all these amazing things together, travel all over the world. And that community, that support, that tribe is really what positioned me to feel really good about making choices for my career that took me all over the U.S. Awesome. So then you get into corporate. You're sometimes negotiating well, maybe sometimes not. You know, you don't know. You're just a young engineer. You're paving your way through your career. Yeah. What was support like inside of the corporate world? So I was underpaid early on in my career, right? I was definitely underpaid. I did not negotiate yeah. well, right? <laughs> Raise your hand if you were underpaid early on in your career. Yes. So I was not paid well early on. And when I started to ask the questions, I knew that I wanted to ask for more, but I didn't have the know-how. I didn't have the language. I didn't understand my value to the company. So I couldn't make an argument that was convincing to anybody who actually had decision-making power. So I had a lot of you know, mentors in the organization as well as sponsors and sponsorship is such a key part of building a career that's going to be able to elevate and kind of outpace your peers. And I talk about that a lot in some of the podcast episodes that, that my co-host and I do. Sponsorship is very critical. And I had sponsors who did not look like me. I had sponsors that were, um, that were easily my grandfather's age, right? Or my yeah. father's age, right? Because engineering is, was very, very dominated at that time by older white men. And those men, because I had demonstrated this aptitude as a really qualified engineer, they saw the value right in me and my aptitude got them to think, well, you know, we can bet on her, right? She delivers on the results no matter what. So worst case scenario, the problem gets solved. Best case scenario, the problem gets solved and the business is happy. So that sponsorship really also opened my eyes to, well, if they can make these kinds of opportunities and these inroads happen for me just by the you know, sponsorship association, how do I double down, right? How do I get more sponsors and how do I look for more opportunities for myself? Because your career is really your own. If you're waiting for leaders in the organization to come and kind of tap you on the shoulder, that only happens once you've delivered exceptional results. That only happens once you have demonstrated a value and then people wanna be associated with that. It's like, okay, you're a winner, right? You got the goods. Now I wanna make sure that I sponsor you and vice versa. Now this is a mutually beneficial relationship because I want to be seen as a leader that sees good talent. And then I want to be able to bring good talent, you know, to more opportunities to solve more problems. So I had amazing sponsorship and mentorship with throughout my entire career. And I just wanted to make this point. I think employee resource groups have been a game changer for me in my career personally. Oh. Working directly with um, the Black Champions Network when I was at General Mills and working directly with the BRG, the Black Resource Group, when I was with my latest organization, really helped me to then get to collaborate and work with other Black professionals. And those Black professionals became my network, internal to the organization, and positioned me to be able to have really great partnerships and negotiating power with other functions, right? So you don't realize then how your network impacts your ability to have know-how to know where the next great opportunity could be. So I think using employee resource groups also was a transformation opportunity for me to get further mentorship in places that you know I would not have had a right to otherwise. That's so interesting to hear because they didn't exist when I was around. Oh, wow. Yeah, so that was something that was definitely... So it is interesting to talk in some respects with uh, many people and hear their stories. Mm -hmm. So, and I, that's why I always ask about support because yeah. it was like not good for me. Okay. Now I do resonate and I love when you say that you have to prove yourself first. Because I like to talk about how, you know, once you 
prove yourself to yourself. Uh-huh. That's that's really important, right? It is. Yeah, prove yourself to yourself. I love that sentiment, right? Because if you're trying to prove yourself to someone else and they don't give you the validation or the recognition you're looking for, that actually can hurt your confidence, right? That can make you feel less valued as an asset and you it can be discouraging. So proving yourself to yourself and saying, you know, I'm doing this, I've done this and I'm doing amazing regardless of what other people tell me. Once you actually had the results to talk about it, right? Because we don't want to just be delusional. <laughs> right. right. We're not lying to ourselves. Right. Right. We want to make sure we're actually doing the thing and bringing the value. And then we can acknowledge that for ourselves. And then we have to be able to talk about that. We have yeah. to say, you know, Maria does excellent work in this circumstance for these types of projects because people won't know that you're amazing. People won't know that you're excellent until you tell them <laughs> oftentimes. And maybe and, you won't either. That's why it's like once yeah. and once you have that, you can't take it away. Very true. Right? Very now, true. remembering that you have that and, and leveraging that, that's where we get into some, some juicier conversations about negotiations. Yeah. How do we do it? What are the basics? Okay. So the basics are first, starting from a position of you know that you are an asset. You have to believe that you're an asset to the company in order to be able to convey your value. Right. And that's the part that I know a lot of people get a little uncomfortable about. It's like that seems so braggadocious. It seems so (laughs) audacious. And it is right. It is a little bit audacious. I don't say bragging because I find that bragging has a negative connotation. Right. We all got fingers wagged at us as children about, you know, not not bragging. But in corporate America, you have to be able to tell your story about where you bring value. If you can tell the story about where you bring value to the organization and you make sure you're talking to other people who understand that value and the business benefits, then they're going to say, we need to have her in the organization. We need to have her be a part of this organization. We can't do this work without her. Right. Those are the kind of the phrases that you want people to be saying about your work only after you're able to give them proof of your performance, right? So I call those receipts or proof of performance. So you have to believe, <laughs> I love right? it. Going back, old, <laughs> going back to old school, remember when there used to be, um, there used to be UPC codes on the side of the box that had a proof of purchase, right? On the side when rebates, now we're dating ourselves, Maria. Right, you know? yeah, I know. <laughs> but- <laughs> Proof of purchase is really the receipts, all of the things that you have demonstrated, the results you bought to the company tied directly to your objectives, right? If you're in an organization that's doing a great job in providing objectives, if not, then you can make sure that the work that you're doing actually ties back to the bottom line. And you're going to be, you know, really explicit about that. Because here's the thing. A lot of women are doing great work, but they're doing work that may not be valued and it may not be measured. Right. News, oh, right? so good. It's oh, that is a gem. <laughs> so here's the gem, right? If you have to do work, make sure that work is being measured and make sure that somebody cares that it gets delivered. Make sure that report that you're working on and make sure that data that you're analyzing, someone is saying this work matters and I'm going to apply it to something else in the bottom line. And that is getting measured because what matters gets measured. If you're doing work that matters and is getting measured, then you can calculate your results. Now you have receipts, right? So try to take folks through that process of making sure you're focusing on projects that actually matter and are getting measured, because then that's how you create leverage for yourself. As you do work that's valued, you become a more valuable asset, and then you use that value to leverage, to negotiate for whatever it is you think you want. Now, for a lot of people, and oftentimes we talk about salary, right? And that's important, base salary. We also talk about the wider range of ways that you can be compensated. And that's why the title Mm -hmm. of the book is Salary Power Moves, Winning the Compensation Negotiation. Yeah, I love that. I noticed that too. I picked up on, ooh, because to me, everything can be a negotiation. Every single thing, right? Every single thing. And I have clients who have negotiated everything from they've relocated and they've gotten um, Mm -hmm. a low interest mortgage from their company, right? Because they relocated, they negotiated that in. It wasn't on the table, right? It wasn't something that was, you know, in a typical offer package, but she knew that that was important to her in order to be successful was financially making sure her family had somewhere to live. And she was able to negotiate that in. I've also had clients who were working for companies that were, you know, doing really well that particular year. So they wanted to make sure that they were going to cash in on that year's performance. So they got bonuses that were maybe 50% of their base salary in that year. 
So now that's not something that's going to be recurring, but it's certainly an opportunity for you to cash in in this year, right? Once you're fully informed, you have the ability to negotiate for that. I've also had clients that done that have used the tools to negotiate for amazing professional development, right? They want to go to a certain number of conferences every year. They want to be, you know, presented as a speaker on panels. So you can take advantage of building all that into your negotiation, especially when you're a new candidate, you're an entering candidate into the company. Ooh. You're a new hire. You're in the midst of applying for a role. The company says, listen, you're a fit. You're great. We want you. That's the time when the negotiation begins. A lot of people think, well, they made me an offer and I have to accept or decline it. Mm -hmm. You do not have to do either. Right. You have to negotiate at that moment in time <laughs> because once they give you the offer, that's when the negotiation can begin because you understand that you're, you have the leverage now, right? And the company also has leverage too. So now you guys are in a mutually beneficial dance and yeah. that's when negotiation can really come to fruition. So those are just three things that I um, can call out, you know, without, for the benefit of time, I have a whole list of things in my book that you can incorporate into your negotiation depending on what you value and what you need to graduate degrees, to additional, you know, stock options and long-term incentives, additional flexibility, work from home, you name it. I have a long list of things that can be incorporated into the negotiation. And sometimes they're just things that are not on the page. So the idea is to make sure that you're being as creative as possible, but you know what you want, right? You know what you want, you know what you need in order to feel successful in the role. And you start with a high aspiration. You start higher than where you believe you're going to land because negotiation means there are sometimes can be concessions. Sometimes there's no concessions. Sometimes you go in with what you ask for and you get exactly what it is. And that's amazing. Yes. And sometimes it feels like, man, I should have asked for even more then, right? I should have upped my expectation. So I do think high aspirations are super important. And then to be very creative and honest about what it is you want in order to get um, the company aligned to giving you what you want through the negotiation. I think that whole creative part is super essential. And it is something that, you know, you don't even know to, to pull into the recipe ahead of time, I guess, you know, so, you know, a lot of people just looking for a job, maybe, you know, they don't have those support systems mm -hmm. and without those support systems, it probably minimizes that creative um, opportunity in those moments of time. And that's um, why I'm here. That's, that's what right. you should call me. <laughs> that's <laughs> right. exactly why I'm here. And it's funny because I've actually helped lots of talented people who are internal candidates negotiate for better compensation, especially if they're taking on new responsibility, they're taking on a unique assignment, something has changed in their day to day. And they're trying to figure out, does this create an opportunity for me to negotiate for more? And nine times out of 10, it does right? If you're a valuable asset, but you have to introduce that and you have to be creative in the way that it goes, that it transitions. It may not all be in salary. Those other creative ways get you to more opportunities for a yes. So when you ask for a variety of things that come from different budgets within the company, then there's an opportunity where they'll say, sure, we're willing to pay for X, Y, Z, right? On your behalf. And that creativity is really important, but it also comes from, you know, a disciplined learning and understanding of the market and of the company. So that's where I come in. And I really, really get jazzed to help clients, right? When yeah. on the other side of that negotiation, because I know that the company is also winning because they're getting a great talented asset that they'll continue to benefit from for years and years and years. So I love helping clients build out that strategy and then go on to execute that strategy successfully to get whatever it was that they negotiated for. Right. So you and I have slightly uh, different um, experiences in that, you know, back in my day, I didn't have those uh, sponsorships and mentors were really not uh, uh, a popular, definitely not sponsorships. Okay. You might be able to hear of mentorships from time to time. I know a lot of the women that I'm talking to lately are then, you know, maybe in this gap or in positions where they don't have those supportive resources and they have like 15 years of experience, maybe more, maybe they've been spending years working toward a promotion that they're, they've kind of put all their eggs in a basket, if you will. Mm -hmm. And you know, a lot of times I've heard too many heartbreaking stories where the results were not in their favor. Yeah. And because they spend so much time into this one path, 
Uh, and maybe there's a lot of reasons for that, right? Maybe you're geographically, you know, um, you know, isolated or, or located or, or many different factors that can go into that kind of limitation. Um, any advice then too, for people, you know, of these decades of uh, experience, mostly because what I, I was really turned on with your, your story where you, you got out of engineering. I did. And part of it was that, right? Part of it was <clears throat> there are large companies who value very specific sets of things, right? If you are working in Silicon Valley now, computer programmers, coding, those, those folks are the ones that are getting a lot of opportunity, right? So if you work in an organization where your skill set and what you bring to the table isn't the top priority, you're definitely going to have to be very creative and strategic in the choices you make. When I moved out of engineering, it wasn't only to move up the decision-making continuum, but it was also to give me a wider breadth of options for where my career could go. In a technical path, it tends to be very linear and it's very time-driven. Mm -hmm. It's very much, you know, you're next in line. You've been doing this for this number of years. Yes. And if you stay at that path, you know, if there's nine people ahead of you, all those nine people have to retire or, you know, or die in their seat, right, in order for you to get the next opportunity. And that becomes discouraging because you think, I was thinking to myself, well, but I'm ready now, right? Or I want to see something different. I want to take on a new yes. challenge and opportunity. So I did everything I could while I was in engineering to get a wide range of experiences to work on all kinds of um, different problem solving methodologies. I did um, Six, Six Sigma green belts. I did certifications. I traveled to Canada. I, walked, I worked on all kinds of things. So I felt very good about what I brought to it. But if I had to wait in line, you know, I might be in my 60s, right, before I felt like the opportunity really was going to be worthwhile for me to um, excel in my career. So taking the path of considering other opportunities was what was right for me, right, in that organization at that time. And I think that if we can have the benefit of someone, and I had a career coach. So I had an amazing ah. career coach, um, Paula Goldschmidt, and she really helped me to think about my career as very intentional choices that I was making to bring in new skill sets and to get broader exposure so I could expand past where I was at that time. Um, and that really helped me to see me leaving engineering doesn't mean that I'm not capable, right? Because a lot of times it's like, well, you know, you're quitting and you're, you know, you're taking an easier route. And I got some of those comments, right? Oh, and it was like, I hear you, right? I got that. I'm pretty sure that the results that I've already delivered should speak for themselves. And if they don't, well, then you're not looking to, you're not looking at facts. So my goal was to create as many opportunities for myself as possible to do a variety of things that would A, check my box on interest, right? Me learning and having autonomy and being able to positively influence the organization and people around me. So leaving engineering, I still have a soft spot, right? I still have a soft spot. Of Always. Also wanted to be an advocate for engineering, right? So when I left the organization, when I left the engineering organization, then I could go other places and talk about what the value was for engineers being on the team or bringing, in, bringing them in early on in the process, which is what I felt like potentially was missing. So like, you know, it's one of those things, how do I impact my little corner of the world? How do I do work that is actually impactful to people that I care about and I see value in, but maybe others don't? So leaving actually, I think, helped me to be able to be a positive influence on folks who remained in that organization. I still mentored and sponsored folks who were in the engineering organization and created opportunities for them where it made the most sense. So you, your question was, 15 year veteran, right? Doing, you know, can do the job with their eyes closed for the most part, um, one hand behind their back, but they're waiting for their next opportunity. Or where, they get passed up. They, they get passed up. And here's right? the, that's the reality of lots of people's situation. And I think if we're spending our time and energy doing great work, keeping our head down, just delivering mm -hmm. against the work, we're not gonna get promoted. You're not gonna get that opportunity. You have to be out advocating for yourself, talking about the work that you're doing, building relationships and getting that sponsorship. The way that I've seen careers really accelerate or even move at a, at a sustainable pace is because there are leaders, there are people outside of you that are advocating for you, right? Yes. Now multiplied your network of people who are now saying, 
I think Maria would be great for this opportunity. I think she should be the one that we consider because you have to talk to them about the work in order for them to talk to others about the work. And for your name to be mentioned in rooms that you're not in, that is when sponsorship really happens. And that's when sponsorship actually materializes in a really real way. But if we're focused on, I'm just gonna you know, keep my head down and do the work. I'm not gonna talk about what I do. I'm not gonna build any relationships then those people are the ones who unfortunately get passed over. And it's not because they're not qualified. It's not because they're not capable. It's not because people don't think that they could do a good job. It's just the word is not broad enough. The word has not spread enough that they should be the right person to make that short list. Because we've all heard of really short list opportunities, right, Maria? Where it's like, who are the right people? Who should we think about? You know, six men are sitting in the room deciding who the next leader of XYZ is. And you need to be in the you need to be on the list. And how do you get on the list? Right. And you need to know that those conversations are happening all the time. And when and you are networked and you are socializing businessly appropriate, yeah. you're going to pick up on those things. Absolutely. Yeah. And Absolutely. of course, I'm a huge advocate. I do believe that women in male dominated industries actually really possess uh, a very, very important uh, mixture, if you will, for the future of women's leadership. So help us understand where are we taking women's leadership? Uh, you know, that's certainly one of my my big topics. Mm -hmm. You know, why is it so important to have women in these roles? It's so important to have women in these roles because there's so many studies now that have been produced. The one that I'm thinking about now is a McKinsey study that says when you have diversity in your organization, in your leadership, you are more likely to be successful, right? You are more likely to make money. Right. So I know that's what people pay attention to. <laughs> it comes down you to the bottom make, line. <laughs> there you go. The bottom line benefits from having a diverse workforce, culturally diverse, as well as gender diverse. So if organizations can then see, well, I want to make more money, right? Because that's capitalism. I want to be able to sell to more clients. I want to be able to tap into audiences that I'm currently not tapped into. Then I need to bring women on to these, to these opportunities to create the right kind of innovation, the right kind of collaboration, and the right kind of cultures so that you can have more employees in your organization that want to thrive, right? That want to stay. And fortunately, culture is a series of actions amongst the people who are in the organization. So the more people you bring in that are going to help to be great sponsors, that are going to be problem solvers, that are going to be advocates for employees, that are going to be mentors and sponsors, now you're really getting that secret sauce, that really special combination. I know a lot of talented women leaders. One of them I'm thinking about um, is a vice president at a multinational organization. And essentially because she is in the room, she has created inroads and clarity around brand campaigns, right? That we're specifically looking to target this type of consumer. And here's what we're thinking about saying. And the answer is maybe not, right? Let's go about it this way. How can we refine that? How can we tune it in so that the consumer actually gets the message you're trying to send? But it only happened because she's in the room. Yes. So I think this is a this is really an edict for companies, right? For large organizations to be very intentional about bringing in diverse talent um, and bringing in women to, to leadership roles. And when you do that, to nurture them, to give them an environment where they can be successful, where they can thrive, right? And where they're going to get sponsorship and professional development themselves, because then they'll stay and that will cascade. And then listen, men, you guys can be allies, right? You can be very intentional about being a sponsor as a man of a young up and coming woman, you know, albeit something that, you know, there's a group of people that you're sponsoring, add those people in, bringing in those young engineers, right? Those young women uh, marketers, those young women sales folks will absolutely make them a better asset to you, right? As a leader. And it'll also give you a disproportionate advantage from teams that don't have the right sauce, right? They don't have the juice. So right. I think that's why it's so important to have women in the roles. And once you have them in the organization to make sure that you give them what they need to be successful. And that's the part that I find a lot of companies are bringing them in, but may not have that culture element of bringing them in and helping them to be successful. And that's where I think the work is. And that's where my company is spending a lot of time and energy, right? Working directly with large organizations and clients who are trying to cultivate that talent and keep them in the organization. So as a coach, if you're if you're looking to sustain and retain those folks, 
bringing in talented coaching, if you don't have it inside of your organization, is an absolute great start where you can kind of offset the, the deficit, right, of other re resources that may be in the company temporarily or on a long-term basis. Right. And what I like to talk about is it's, it's that it's reciprocating. Yeah. Right. So when a leader is truly open, right, when they're closed and they can't see the value of the, the female contribution or what the, this diversity is bringing to them, then they're actually just closed off to that reciprocating. Oh, I'm going to actually learn something from this person and they are actually going to help me build value, even not only in my leadership, but within this company, all heading toward the same goal of profitability, really. Exactly. And I think it also comes back to the, the salary and compensation negotiation. When you have people that are paid well and that recognize that they are valued, right? Because compensation normally for employees is a direct correlation to value. When you do the right thing and people feel valued, they are going to go above and beyond. They're going to deliver. They're going to go the extra mile. They're going to refer other really great employees to your company. So doing the right thing up front and investing in making sure people are adequately compensated is the right thing for your business, is the right thing for your culture, is the right thing for your retention. So I think that people doing advocating for themselves, right, is where we started the conversation, being a self-advocate and making sure that you feel like you're doing what's in your own best interest because you're an asset and you bring value to the company, it impacts everywhere. Just like you were saying, it impacts your culture, it impacts your leadership capability, it impacts your ability to attract more great people. So all these things are really behaviors that require senior leaders in an organization to have a clear vision, right? And to believe that there is a way to do this differently, right? A lot of companies for in the past, you know, had a different perspective and talking about salary compensation or talking about negotiation was just unheard of. And there was no transparency in those areas. And I think the companies that are going to do it well, companies that are looking towards the future are going to continue to do it well, and they're going to win the war on talent, right? They're going to attract the right people and their culture is going to grow and thrive and benefit as a result of it. So the book, Salary Power Moves, Winning the Compensation Negotiation, really helps to solve for the individual, but it also helps for companies to do what's in the long-term best interest of the company by supporting their employees. It, to some extent, you know, what I like to say is that it's going to make leadership actually a little easier and it's going to help accelerate those leadership positions. Um, so I love it. Awesome. Help us understand a little bit about what women are lacking as far as business acumen. Oh, okay. So listen, this one, is, <laughs> Tell us, please. <laughs> this one gets juicy, right? And it gets juicy because a lot of times, um, and I can speak to this from my own experience, a lot of times we fall into focusing on being well-liked, right? In our workplace, we want to be friends. We want to be um, thought of well. We want to be um, a part of the community. And I think that's important, right? Because we spend so many hours at work, we want to make sure that we feel included. However, as we understand building those relationships, we also have to understand that our time at work is an investment. And we want to make sure we're investing in our careers very intentionally and proactively. So I talked a little bit earlier about doing work that's measured that people care about. Learning what the organization cares about really helps you to then translate that into language that you can use to your advantage. So, for example, if your company is focused on um, cost of goods, right, you work in a large consumer um, packaging company, your company's focused on cost of goods, you begin to understand the all of the lines and costs that go into total cost of goods. Now, your business acumen that you've acquired from getting that understanding positions you to be able to speak the language of the business. Now you can talk about cost of goods. Now you can talk about top line and bottom line. Now you can talk about quarter to quarter. Now you can talk about earnings. Right. So like I would say for folks who are like, oh, you just speak in another language here. Right. I know. But I'm like, oh, that's so cool. It's, it's so juicy. juicy. Right. Because. <laughs> Start by listening to your earnings calls. Every publicly traded company has an earnings call quarterly. And normally that earnings call is hosted or facilitated. Um, and the CEO, the CFO, other senior leaders are speaking to analysts and investors about where their priorities are for that quarter. 
that call will give you kind of an outline blueprint of these are the things that the CEO and the CFO are talking about and our investors and the investment community are going to react to. I need to understand some of those things. Pick two or three things out of that call and say, I want to get a better understanding of e-commerce. I want to get a better understanding of supply chain logistics, right? Pick two or three things that maybe you don't have a good understanding of today. Do your own research, do a bit of Googling, do a bit of, you know, checking out the Wall Street Journal, checking out the Philadelphia Business Journal, right? Thinking about these places where business leaders are getting their information. The better you can get at understanding what the business is motivated by, then you can speak the language of the business. And once I was able to then speak the language of the business and understand how my work contributed to that, then I really had the ability to develop clear strategies to help the business grow. So I think oftentimes we focus, you know, really in our individual discipline, right? This is my, you know, channel in engineering, and I am going to make sure that my thermocouples all function the way that they're supposed to, right? And make sure that all of my controls, you know, measure the temperature of the cooker throughout the process. And I got that down. And that's important, right? Because you want to be a subject matter expert in your discipline. But in order to really have... Um, clear ability to navigate the company holistically, you got to bring up your business acumen. So I think earnings calls is a good place to start. Sometimes companies will have town halls, right? Maybe they have quarterly town halls and they'll present, you know, the current financials during the current town hall, getting a better understanding of where the financials are and where costs are high, where costs are low, where you can impact those costs, again, gets you an opportunity to really talk speak the language of the business. And that's what people are really measuring. And that's what people are care about. And they're going to see you as a leader, right? They're going to see you as someone who does the preparation, who goes the extra mile to do the work, but you're getting smarter throughout the process, right? And then you use that additional understanding of the business to make sure that you're working on things that matter, right? So that if somebody tries to give you an assignment that feels, you know, way off and left field and has no actual value to the business, you can kind of ask the question and say, well, how does that affect the bottom line? Why is that important? And what will the, how will the business benefit from me doing this work? And that might feel like, oh, wow, you know, should I be asking those kind of questions? I think so. I think all of us have to ask those questions of our managers and of our leadership so that we make sure that we have the leverage that we need in order to be valuable assets to the organization. If we're spending a bunch of time doing things that are not measured, that do not matter, it will put you in a place where you are liked, but you're not valued. And without value, then you have no leverage. So I really want folks to think about learning more about um, the elements of the business that they can, even if it's by building a relationship with your procurement partner, right? Procurement does a lot. They're the face of the business to your external suppliers. Learning more about your suppliers and how you go through that process can help you to make better business decisions. So I try to give folks little plugs of ways that they can build their business acumen so that they can speak the language of the business because then you know your work, the work that you're doing will be valued because you understand the business. Yeah. Um, what was interesting, not only from my experience, but then what I try and translate as well is that, you know, because definitely, you know, you have an engineering degree, you're a woman in STEM of some nature, you're smart and capable. And sure. just by showing up to, to your work, um, you know, stereotypically, if you tend to be more uh, a social, you know, person, you're going to be naturally placing yourself in these conversations and learning that stuff. And it's, I think a lot of times it's just highlighting the idea and the fact that you're actually growing your business acumen. And sometimes you may not even know it. Sure. And there, there are those conversations if you're, if you're in the right rooms, right. And you're getting a chance to talk to people who are doing, you know, great work and you're, you know, collaborating with your cross-functional partners, right. Cause I know in engineering, a lot of time we work directly with R and D, we work directly with quality. Maybe we work directly with operations. So all of those people are working on different sides of the business and looking at it from different angles. So the more, you know, really robust conversation you guys can have about, problem solving and how it directly impacts the business, everybody's really upping their game, right? And learning a little bit more and then becoming more valuable to the business. So 
even if you work in functions that are support functions, a lot of times people are like, well, you know, maybe I work in HR, or I work in legal. Those are very support functions and maybe I won't have the opportunity. I think those support functions really benefit from being in a very super specialized niche where you can bring a ton of value to a conversation and then your, your business partners can show up and bring the ton of value. So it's about um, just being probed, right? And being poised to say like, hey, I, I want to learn a little bit more about, talk to me more about this project that you're working on. Talk to me about, you know, where are the priorities for the organization and how are you contributing to them? Because I want to make sure that I'm doing the same thing, right? I want to make sure. And I think that kind of brings me to another point, which is like talking about salary. I was just going to say, room. okay, well, oh, talking about salary. Okay, go. Because yeah. there's another piece there, if I can just interject, is that when you're in those situations, a lot of times, especially if you tend to be uh, more the sh um, the shy or quiet type, yeah. that there's um, a little bit of finding your voice and feeling comfortable speaking in those environments. Sure. So you're not only learning and being a part of that, but, you know, and you don't have to be crazy, you know, like, you know, audacious, but to say what's on your mind and insert and have that confidence that you are in the right place at the right time. And to be the person that you're meant to be is really, really important. Yeah. So Maria, I think that comes and you said confidence and I think confidence comes from perceiving that you have yeah. something to value, right? You Absolutely. have something to bring to the table and that your contribution will add value. It will dimensionalize the conversation better. It will challenge the conversation to go in the right direction, right? But believing that, having that confidence really does come internally. And unfortunately, there's lots of environments that don't encourage that kind of natural um, behavior in women. But I think if we follow our curiosity and we you know, are curious from a place of respect and like sincere, looking to understand, looking to evolve and learn more, then you'll be in conversations that you had no idea the direction was going to take that path. But it comes from a place of having not only confidence in yourself, which is what I do a lot of work on with my clients, lots and lots of work that I'm doing with my career coaching clients is building their confidence so that they can then take on new challenges and move into new environments and not succumb to the fear, right? right. A lot of us have fear of moving into a new space or changing jobs or moving into a new company because we're not sure how we'll be received and we're not sure if it's going to feel good, right? But most of that's driven by fear. But if you feel good about yourself, you know that you're a valuable asset and that you have the right relationships within the organization, your confidence to show up in those rooms, to ask the questions, to lead with your curiosity really does allow you to be a valuable asset. And I think, you know, we should talk more about that. I think I have uh, I had a cross-functional partner who worked with me in communications and he and I would constantly be in a back channel having conversations about, you know, well, here's what I think and what do you believe and, you know, what do you know so far? So this, it started very organically, but it became to a place where we both respected each other as valuable subject matter experts. And my curiosity was sincere and it was to solve the problem, right? It was to make sure that the team was successful. And once we understood that, we could then go to the moon, right? There were all kinds of things that were like, well, maybe if we try this and what would that look like? And now you're having a real innovation kind of um, experience where new things get created and you too benefit individually, but also the company benefits. But it all comes from, using your curiosity, using your voice, right? Taking up a little bit more space than you felt comfortable taking up yesterday. And we can do that for each other, right? Maria and I are in a meeting together. I can say, Maria, I'd love to hear from you on this topic. Yes. So really inclusive leaders will make sure that people who are a little bit more on the shy side or maybe a little bit more introverted get an opportunity to have the stage, right? To have the floor. And that's the kind of leadership that all of our organizations need, right? To bring that inclusivity in. But I was mentioning earlier. Yeah. I'm sorry. I, I caught you off and we were going to go down a whole nother we awesome. Were. We <laughs> go. Were. And I just want to talk about it because I know we're getting, we're getting close to time. I know. When we are transparent about our compensation with I others in the organization, we create a powerful groundswell. And a lot of times, I love how you said that powerful groundswell, because if I know what I am making, and I also know what you are making, we now can collaborate and work together and say, okay, well, how do we make sure that we both get more of what we're looking for? The only people who benefit from us not talking about our compensation is the company, 
right? Yes. The company can keep us very underinformed, and it's a very one-sided dynamic, right? They know what everyone makes, and they know how to dial out one thing to for one group versus the other. If we create that transparency amongst ourselves, how powerful can we now be in our next negotiation? Because we have an internal data point. Now, you can use things like Payscale, you can use things like Glassdoor and LinkedIn, these great resources to do Intel, um, to make sure you're doing research on your salary and compensation opportunities. But if you can get some internal dialogue going, and maybe you don't feel comfortable sharing exactly how much money you make. Maybe it's about sharing a range. Maybe it's, you know, I started here, you know, and I'm looking to be in this range and after my next performance review. Even with that range, now you are equipped, you are armed with very valuable information that can impact your next compensation negotiation. And I'll give you guys a gem, right? On top of it. So many have been dropped. So Another many. So many. Another me one is. Every role in every organization has a salary range, right? Has a band, as I've heard a lot of people call it. That salary range normally is information that you can directly ask for from your HR partner. Hey. So you can reach out to your HR partner and say, for the range, for the role that I'm in or the level that I am, what is the typical salary range? And you may find out that you're in the middle of the range, you're at the bottom, or you're at the top. But now you know what the range is. So again, you're equipped with useful information that you can then, you know, put in your pocket to prepare for your next negotiation because the next negotiation is always right around the corner. But thinking about ways to be transparent with people that you trust and you respect internal to your organization and in your friend group, right? I know specifically for me, Marie, and I don't know if this was your experience, that I had lots of other engineers that I like you know, talk to when we were doing work, there were actually engineers that I would meet in the airport, right? Because we're always traveling. Yes. We're always on our way to our next destination. So building those relationships and saying, you know, how much are you making here? And what are you guys doing here? And what are their incentives? That kind of real time data and information always helped me to be better poised to decide, am I in the right organization? Am I being compensated fairly? Should I be negotiating? Or should I continue consider leaving the organization, right? Sometimes in order to get what you believe you deserve, it takes you transitioning out of your current organization and going somewhere else to get that additional compensation. But it's not for everyone. So, but that information, that intel is really what helps you make those decisions. So it's kind of a part of that research and preparation for your negotiation. Yeah. And I'll just add to that in that, in my experience, when that happened, it was pretty awesome because, you know, it was, it was neutral. It was it was like we were collaborating together exactly. and it, it wasn't like uh, a boastful, like, oh, like, you know, I'm doing this and, and oh, you're doing that. It wasn't demeaning in, in any way. It was actually, this is what I love about men is that a lot of times they can just be matter of fact. Yeah. They're just like, you know, they have no holes barred. They just, yeah. you know, do and they'll state the facts, especially mm -hmm. whenever you're in those type of relationships where you're willing and able to share. And yeah. that is powerful. It is very powerful. And I come from a place where I believe that there is abundance, right? So if I tell you how much I make today, I know that there's opportunity for me to make more tomorrow and the next year and the next year. So thinking about it as this limited perspective and there's only enough space for one of us to be able to, that, that kind of fixed mindset is a trap. And that it's fixed mindset will keep you having very little intel and information so that how do you make sure that you can excel and move forward? Being collaborative, having that growth mindset, believing in abundance is really how even the, the book came together because Sally Power Moves winning the compensation negotiation was giving those skills to other people. I want everyone to be able to negotiate for more compensation. I want everyone to feel like they're being adequately paid and they're paid their value. I want you know 10,000 women to be able to negotiate for better compensation in the next year. That's what I want to have happen. And that's because I believe abundance is out there. And I believe with the right skills, with the right tools, and potentially with the right support, right? If you want to use me as a coach, there's the game that could be changed is mind blowing, right? But it really takes us having the skills, having that confidence and being of the belief that there is abundance, that there's more out there for us. And it just takes us the right know-how and being in the right negotiation Yes. With the right counterparty in order to get that. Awesome. And I know we are, I knew this was going to be jam packed full of all kinds of gems. Help us understand. Um, and I usually close with a quote. I know we didn't touch base on that before because we were so happy about the weather. Oh, I do yeah. have a quote 
just in case you don't, um, from JFK. Okay. Who, who says, let us never negotiate out of fear, but let us never fear to negotiate. We cannot negotiate with people who say what's mine is mine and what's yours is negotiable when the final result is expected to be a compromise. It is often prudent to start from an extreme position. Leah, I can't help, I can't say thank you enough for all of your gems. Help us understand how do we get the book? How do we get in touch with you? And thank you, thank you so much for be, and being an amazing guest on the show. Awesome. Well, Maria, thank you for having me. It has been great. You can get the book directly from my website at gemsforthejourney.org. And I'll make sure Maria has that information so she can put it in the show notes. Yes. It's gemsforthejourney.org. You can purchase the book directly from my website. You can follow me on LinkedIn. Um, I'm Leah Murphy on LinkedIn. And my company also has a LinkedIn page, Career Gems for the Journey. You can find all of the contact information that you're looking for on LinkedIn or directly on my website. And you can grab the book. And as an extra bonus, we also have a podcast at Career Gems for the Journey, the Career Gems for the Journey podcast. And 100% of all the episodes are on all the listening platforms on Apple Music, as well as Spotify, you name it. So please do take an opportunity to go over there to get deeper into some gems, specifically around sponsorship, mentorship, negotiation, and what how you find your motivators to really drive your career. All of that is there. This has been amazing, Maria. I appreciate your time. Thank you so much. Thank you for being a part of the conversation for inspiring women's leadership. Coffee Time with Kaufman is the comfortable place to discuss women's leadership because I am on a mission to help the world discover the truth about what women are capable of. When you are ready for your leadership mastery makeover, go to mariacoffman.com and click on consult a coach where you can schedule time with me for an empowerment session. Have a great week. Enjoy your adventures and journey responsibly. Thanks, Leah. Bye, Maria.